This lawful U.S. resident is facing deportation over a crime that may have never occurred. You're not a bad hombre. No. I've been here since I was 17 years old. Plus, we're at a fork in the road with North Korea, and there may be no turning back. They will be met with fire and fury. We'll break it down with E.J. Otero, former director of intelligence operations at CINCOM. Plus, we'll go one-on-one -on -one with Senator Bill Nelson. This is Money, Power, and Politics. lead off by challenging conventional wisdom on both sides of the aisle. And we'll start with some news that may scare Democrats like something out of an old movie. We have to win more. We're going to win more. Yeah, the election map looks pretty terrifying for Democrats next year. So after all this talk of Democratic energy, they could wind up losing even more ground in Congress. You may be thinking, wait a minute, the president's approval rating is tanked and polls showed Democrats trouncing Republicans in a generic congressional ballot. Well, yes, but Democrats also have to defend many more seats on the other side's turf, just as they tried to this year in Georgia, Kansas and Montana. And you have a 538 analysis that found the numbers are stacked against the Democrats. Because in the Senate, Democrats have to defend 25 seats, while Republicans only have to defend eight. 538 also pointed out that Republicans could lose every swing state next year in the Senate races and still hold the majority. And in the House, districts are drawn in such a way that it puts Democrats at a striking disadvantage there, too. The 538 analysis also noted Democrats could win Every House district that Hillary Clinton won and every House district that President Trump won by less than three points and still not get the majority and lose up to five seats in the Senate along the way. So, so far tonight, we've startled Democrats, but we haven't yet startled Republicans. Well, I can change that in a hurry. <laughs> Thank you, vintage Ronald Reagan. You get now, the beyond the expanding investigation of Russia and the Trump campaign and beyond the FBI raiding the home of the president's former campaign chairman and beyond Trump's sagging approval ratings, even among his base, let's look at what the president told the Miami Herald last year about climate change. Well, I'm not a big believer in man-made climate change. Oh, government scientists said he's wrong. Their report states that human activity is changing the climate and at a faster pace than previously predicted. The assessment directly contradicts both the statements of President Trump and senior members of his administration. Meanwhile, the president beefed up immigration enforcement, but the pace of deportations has dropped. The Trump administration is deporting illegal immigrants at a slower pace than any year during the Obama administration. That's partly because illegal border crossings are down, but the administration has also spiked deportation orders and expanded the target for who can get deported, which has added to the backlog in court. And it's targeted some people from deportation you may not expect. And that brings us to the plight of Jean-Claude Muse in tonight's We the People. This is the story of a truck driver from Haiti. People are thinking this can't go unpunished. Yes. John Claude Muse was railroaded in court, locked up in prison, and then freed after our team spent years digging up bombshells. I love you, baby. Act two was when you were freed. Yes. And now there's act three. But act three is yet to come. And then I heard like horns beeping and going crazy horns and my mom was screaming. The last thing I remember was her saying, Jesus help us, we're gonna crash. On May 11th, 2001, near the town of Wachula, two girls lost their mom, Nona Moore, and their eight-year-old little sister, Lindsay. A tractor trailer tipped over and crushed their van and John Claude Muse was driving that truck. So troopers found that you were drinking that night? No. I never drank my whole life. They found you were doing drugs? No. Amuse said another driver cut him off, and so he swerved and flipped. He said it was an accident, and so did Nona and Lindsay's loved ones. They begged prosecutors to let it be. I think the community, they lost two precious people that they loved, and they felt like someone had to pay. And they charged Muse with vehicular homicide because they say he must have dozed off behind the wheel. 
Most definitely, he was alert. Our team discovered volunteer firefighter Juan Otero. He was the first witness on the scene and showed up seconds after the crash. Look how sharp that curve is. Watch that car. Okay. Dead asleep, you'd come right through here. You wouldn't have tried to make that curve. But investigators didn't interview Otero, and the jury never heard from him. Because you're talking about sending a man to prison for so many years on an accident. As to the question of how Muse can negotiate sharp turns in the road in his sleep, well, the diagram in the court showed that he didn't. But our team also discovered it did not match the measurements troopers took at the scene. That diagram was flawed, and we got an accident reconstruction expert to prove it. The, their own diagram doesn't stand up to the physical evidence. Still, an all-white jury took less than an hour to convict John Claude, and he got 15 years. Somebody would step up and help me. All you can say is thank you. Well, after a series of our team's investigations, let's just say the judge had seen enough. I hope the example of forgiveness and consideration will lessen your bitterness and allow you to proceed with a productive life. He overturned the conviction and freed John Claude Muse with time served nine years ago. I work, pay my bills, pay my taxes, take care of my family, go to church. I do everything to be a good citizen. And now he's back to driving trucks, has one son heading to college and a little girl just five months old. So every time she look at me, she smile, every time but he may have to leave her behind and leave his son who's off to college and everything he's worked for because there's always a catch. Muse first hit a snag in 2013 under President Obama on a trip to Haiti. Though his conviction was overturned, the feds flagged him for still having that time served on his record. And then President Trump turned up the heat. We have some bad, bad people in this country that have to go out. We're going to get them out. The feds don't know his backstory. They just see time served for vehicular homicide. And you know how that looks in the Trump era. But we have some bad hombres here, and we're going to get them out. And so John Claude Muse, a legal permanent U.S. resident for more than 30 years, who's never had another accident, who's never been charged with any other crime, is facing a hearing to get deported. I don't just anyone keep the child molesters, the rapists, all the bad guys out, but I'm not a bad guy. You're not a bad hombre? No. I've been here since I was 17 years old. By the way, his father just died. My dad fought for this country in Vietnam. His father died on a trip to Haiti. I cannot go to the funeral. And Jean-Claude can't say goodbye. I won't be able to go because of the immigration thing. And after his deportation hearing, we may never see him again, and his little girl, Jael, may never even remember him. I want to remember that I'm a hard worker. If I was in the country, I would have provided for her. And I want her to go up to be somebody. He's hoping, under the circumstances, a judge may vacate that time served on his record. But with backlog courts and time running out, that won't be easy. And I want them to open their heart again. If they have somebody in a high place, try to help me. And so he leaves us, and may soon leave us for good, with a now familiar cry for help. I want anybody that can help me to look to see what's happened in my case. Muse's deportation hearing is scheduled for October 26. We'll continue to follow his case. And meanwhile, the entire world is following the crisis in North Korea. And this has become President Trump's biggest test. There is no bigger mistake than the United States believing that its land is safe across the ocean. Well, North Korea has threatened to attack the United States many times before, but this time is different. North Korea appears to have figured out how to mate a nuclear bomb to a long-range missile. So now they could actually do it. And so North Korea's ally China and the entire UN Security Council voted to ramp up sanctions on North Korea. We don't run scared. 
This had to happen. We had to go after his hard currency. We had to stop him. How he responds, he's going to now have to think, what's the end game? Problem is, erratic murderous dictators don't always think through to an end game, and that's what makes them, by definition, erratic. And President Trump Let's responded by warning erratic. Kim Jong-un of fire and fury if he does not back down. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. Okay, well, please welcome retired Colonel E.J. Otero, former director of intelligence operations at CENTCOM. Thank you for your time. A pleasure. Should the United States preemptively strike North Korea? No, it would be a big mistake uh, at this point. Any preemptive strike without, without a, a, an actual physical display from North Korea would be unwise. So if we go to war with North Korea, how long would it take for us to defeat them? I think we would degrade them like we have done in the past in, in recent examples. We would degrade them to the point of non-effectiveness in, in two to three weeks. Two or three weeks? Yes. And after that, it would be clean up. Is Kim Jong-un a psychopath? Absolutely. Crazy? He, he is insane. This is a gentleman that he has grown in his cocoon. He has grown as a child in a world in which he is the center of the universe. No exposure to the rest of the world, real exposure, like his father and grandfather who faced uh, the Korean War. This man uh, believes that when you tell your country, this is the haircut that I want you to get, and they do, and you believe that everything that you say the world has to uh, bow to you, you're a psychopath. But if you are insane and believe the universe revolves around you, wouldn't you just say, well, I can flatten things too. Here goes. He could do that. And that is, the, that is a wild card. So we're sending two strike carrier groups to the coast of uh, North Korea. If Japan tells us this guy's crazy and he's going to do it, and if we look in our intelligence that the, that the keys are being turned in their nuclear facilities for testing, for practice, for whatever, um, then it would be a joint decision from all these people to decide if we're going to do a joint preemptive strike against uh, North Korea or not. Um, but that is very far. Every president of the United States has faced that, and uh, we have never done it. There's a, it is a lot more complicated than that. On that sobering note, Colonel Otero, thank you. Pleasure. Okay, next, we'll dig into the mess in Washington, one-on-one -on -one with Senator Bill Nelson. He's blowing red lights. There's a school in the neighborhood, Mr. Congressman. Shame on you. Congressman, can we please get a minute? So I was thinking of our old friend and contributor, Charlie LaDuff, this week. And Grim runs away. Look at him go. The Sasquatch of Staten Island. <laughs> yeah, that was Charlie chasing down ex-congressman and ex-con Michael Grimm after Grimm threatened to break this reporter in half. Charlie helped us chase down and call out politicians for years, and though he has moved on, we still call out politicians on both sides when they cross the line. And that brings us to the U.S. Senator, who found a new way to lower the dignity of the U.S. Senate this week. Here's Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson saying he won't speak for John McCain. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not going to speak for John McCain. Then, in the very next breath, he suggested McCain may have voted against the Republican health care plan because it was past his bedtime or because of his brain tumor. He has a brain tumor right now. That vote occurred at 1.30 in the morning. Some of that might have factored in. But McCain had very clearly explained the reasons for his vote. Johnson questioned his explain? brain function. It's, it's the same Ron Johnson who tweeted the loss of Justice Scalia by posting a picture of the wrong guy, then later corrected it. The same Ron Johnson who proposed replacing teachers in the classroom with students just watching more television, who then had the audacity to run ads on TV in which he acts like he's teaching in a classroom. In 2010, there were 57 lawyers. Well, before Johnson questioned McCain's brain function for voting his mind, and before McCain carefully explained his position on health care, he spoke out against the politics of Washington, which has devolved into a bunch of insults and people running their mouths and trying to run over their peers on both sides. So in just a moment, we'll ask our next guest, Senator Bill Nelson, to weigh in on that. And we'll set it up with that last plea from John McCain. Stop listening to the bombastic loudmouths on the radio and television and the Internet. To hell with them. They don't want anything done for the public good. 
Our incapacity is their livelihood. Let's trust each other. Let's return to regular order. Oh, Florida Senator Bill Nelson, thank you again for joining us. Thanks, Craig. The rancor that we see in Washington has escalated, That's, certainly, the past terrible. couple of years. It's terrible. Why? I can't change how other people act, but I can be responsible for how I act and how I treat other people. That's one down, about 300 million yet to go. What about what no, we're seeing? But I'll tell you, you're seeing the proofs in the pudding. Look at the Senate Commerce, Science and Transportation Committee. Two of us lead that committee. I'm the top Democrat. John Thune of South Dakota is the top Republican. They're in the majority. He's the chairman. The two of us get along. We passed a number of major bills. What is so, so toxic in the politics, not only in Washington, but in Tallahassee as well, is that one party wants to run over the other party. Uh, that's not what the framers of the Constitution uh, envisioned. Uh, what has happened is it's gotten so partisan that you, the, the leadership is looking as if we're going to do it this way uh, and we're not even going to consult you and we're going to run over you with the, the rules of the Senate or the we're rules of the House. That is not a good sign and it needs to change and change fast. One party has been trying to run over the other, sadly, for many years. Well, I mean, but we've seen an escalation in the past couple of years, time, clearly, in the rhetoric, in the tone, in the past couple of years. And what is what driving that? Uh, the role model was the Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, and the Republican leader, Bob Michael. They'd fight like the Dickens, but they were personal friends. So at the end of the day, when it was time to put the deal together, they could do it. Now, what has changed over the years is the gerrymandering of congressional districts so that you have a predetermined outcome before the November election. You know who's going to win. And instant communication. You know, back in the founding of this country, uh, they would call each other all kinds of names, but communication was slow. Now it's instant. Fix this map. Find it enormously disappointing. Destroyed this economy. You're going to have to shut up or I'm going to have you arrested. And so there's this constant uh, need to accentuate conflict. And as a result of that, it, it's, it's just gotten out of control and everybody needs to step back and do what you ought to do. Be a gentleman and respect the other person for their beliefs and then try to work out your differences. Senator Nelson, thank you for your perspective. Thanks. Now next, we have insight on the Russia investigation from former FBI agent Dave Kuvatier. A retired FBI Special Agent Dave Kuvatier has insight on Russia and the president and worked under James Comey for years, so that's where Marissa Lynn continues our conversation. Would the former FBI director have any reason to discuss whether it be the president or anyone, whether or not they are under or not under investigation? Long-standing tradition with the FBI is we don't confirm or deny if somebody's under investigation. Now. There are, there's some latitude there. I don't think it was inappropriate for uh, the director to actually tell him once he fell sure, you're, you're not under investigation. I can't get into anything else. Uh, has that been done before? Yes. The president says he, he let him go because he wasn't properly handi handling the Russian investigation. Was he or was he not? What you see is what you get with James Comey. Very professional, very caring, and uh, very patriotic. He, he really cared, and I mean patriotic in, in, you know, in a good way. Um, believing in America, believing in our people, mm -hmm. believing in the Constitution. What he wound up doing was some missteps. And I, what I mean by that, and, and I think that was his demise, he, um, he wound up getting some bad advice, uh, some bad guidance. Um, he broke protocol a little bit. Um, and just because he's the director of the FBI doesn't mean you should do that because you have to set the example, just like we were talking about, set top cover. You've got to be a leader. You've got to set examples for the other FBI employees to follow your lead. He spoke in behalf of the Department of Justice, Maine Justice, in saying that 
no reasonable attorney or prosecutor would take on this case and try to charge it. Even if that's true, that's not our position. Once he did that, we lost, meaning the FBI lost political neutrality. Very important for the FBI to be apolitical. And when he gave a prosecutor opinion, he brought the FBI into the political arena and took away the autonomy that we had up to that moment. Check out our YouTube channel for more inside perspective from Dave on the investigation, the Bureau, and the leaks. Search for Craig Patrick's Money, Power, and Politics and click the red subscribe button at the top of the page. You'll also find our investigations into waste in state and federal government. Well, the crisis in North Korea has rightly pulled focus, but let's not forget closing thought. The president has also gotten in a tit for tat with Senate leadership, and that could come back to haunt him. It started with a focus, yes, on health care reform. But as Newt Gingrich put it, uh, Republican versus Republican with the president, he said it's not a he us kind of situation. The president is on the field. He's not an owner sitting up in the box. He also is one of the players. If he continues to clash with Senate leadership, uh, that could threaten his agenda, including infrastructure, tax reform, tax cuts, uh, and one last run at health care uh, if they do it. Folks, that's our show. We'll see you again next week. Take care.